Building a robust compiler. That's going to be the topic of today's video. I originally had something else planned that we were just going to jump right into the code, but I actually think this is going to help a ton for people who are coming on to the series and who are new and or people who are watching the series and might not really understand exactly what's going on. So this video is going to be no code. It's just going to be 100% of me talking. And yeah, so let's get right into it. What is up guys, DevCode here, back with another video. So we're going to be talking about how to build a robust compiler. This video is going to be subjective in the sense that this is how I'm building my compiler, but you can definitely use this as a blueprint for building your compiler as well, because pretty much almost any compiler out there is built around this system. So we're, there's a couple different phases. Uh, I think there's only two in this slide. I'm going to talk about the concept phase starting off. So let's talk about getting a couple things straight. So why do, why do we need to care about architecture? Uh, it's, you know, architecture is something that I don't think I cared much about in the beginning. Uh, and now that I'm rewriting the compiler, I'm really being careful and critical about how I build my architecture. So when it comes to caring about architecture, I usually think that there's two main things you need to focus on, scale and maintainability. Scale, of course, is pretty obvious. You know, as you're starting out with your language, you wanna build it in a way that you can scale the language. If you guys noticed, I've put out quite a bit of videos about language updates. And the only reason I've been able to like churn out tons and tons of updates back to back on the language and there's been tons of stuff that I haven't even shown you guys that I've been doing to the language is because I respect this rule of focusing on scale so as you're building your language you just want to make sure that you build it in a way in terms of like components so you want to compartmentalize as much of your compiler as possible so that you can reuse different parts and you can strip other things out so on and so forth the second one is maintainability. Um, this one is pretty much almost the same as scale, but it's a little bit different. This one more focuses on working with other people. So if you're going to have other developers on your project working with you, you want to make sure that it's easy to maintain and you're not just writing a bunch of random code that's very spaghetti-like and someone jumping on is going to really have a hard time to figure out exactly what to do and how to help out with the language. So when it comes to conceptualizing the structure, uh, this is kind of how I think every type of programming language that is not a native programming language. So what I mean by that is languages like Java, Python are not truly native languages, right? They don't run directly on the machine. What happens is you write the code in Java that then gets converted into some type of bytecode, uh, whatever that bytecode might be, and then that bytecode executes on the machine. But the compiler designer or the language designer didn't actually write the code to run on each processor. They're just writing the code in C++ to take the bytecode and execute it. So typically those are a lot easier because the language is a lot more portable. But typically those languages are also a lot slower. That's why Python is extremely slow because it's interpreted. Same thing with Java. Java's not that fast either. It's quick, but it's nowhere near as fast as C because of this reason. So typically, whenever you want to have a compiler, you want to make sure you have a front end, a back end, and a bytecode executable. And you want the flow to kind of be like this, right? So you need both of these components, and then you have your bytecode executable at the very end of it. Um, and this is pretty straightforward. Um, and pretty much, I wrote this comma down here. All a compiler is is a state translation machine. Don't overcomplicate things. Compilers are very simple. All you're literally doing is converting one state to another state. So you're taking this imaginary programming language written in this file. You take that text and you convert it into a, bunch, a series of tokens. Once you take those tokens, you then convert those tokens into a tree to represent how those tokens should interact with each other. Then you take that tree and you convert that tree into a class structure. So you create classes, you create functions and fields and so on. Then you take that and you translate that into bytecode. And then you take the bytecode and you, you know, it keeps going on. So 
that's how I want you guys to think about this entire project. So let's move on. Uh, as I said before, you want to modularize as much as possible. I made the mistake of not doing this, and I'm going to tell you firsthand, it was hell to pay when it came to adding new features, when it came to fixing bugs, so on and so forth. So you want to make sure you have a tokenizer, a lexer, which is the, another word for a parser, a code optimizer. Please do not attach this to your compiler. Make this a separate thing. I did that, and it was a shit show. So make sure you separate your code optimizer, your preprocessor, just anything that you can break away from it. Um, and as you can see, the more modularized your compiler is, the easier it is to maintain and diagnose bugs. So think big. Um, this is something that I also didn't do when I first wrote my compiler. It's interesting. This video is kind of also me sharing my the things that I've learned through building a programming language as well as the mistakes that I made and some things to look out for. So I would definitely say when you're building your language, don't think that there's a problem too complicated for you to solve. If you can't figure out how to implement it, try to code it in a way to where you can add the system in later once you figure out how to do it. But I would definitely say don't hold yourself back. Next is the implementation phase. This is pretty simple. Now it's time to build the castle. So how exactly am I going to build a compiler? So when it comes to building compiler, uh, if you guys remember, I had a front end, a back end, and then a bytecode executable. So this is how it actually works. This is a structure. So you have your tokenizer, your parser, and then your error manager. The tokenizer sends data to the parser, and then the parser runs. And at any point, if the tokenizer fails, the parser, once the parser object gets instantiated, it's going to check to see if there were any errors. And if there were any errors, then it's not going to parse it because if you broke something here, you're probably going to break something even worse here. So you don't want to execute anything in the parser. So now we're going to look at how my tokenizer is laid out. So I've made a couple videos about building a tokenizer and you guys can check in my older videos, but I just want to be comprehensive and go over everything. So this is how my tokenizer is built. So my tokenizer is pretty straightforward. So you have your data, uh, which is of course going to be the data that you get from the file that you're tokenizing. You're going to have your error management system that it's going to be firing errors off if it ever finds anything wrong with your code. You're going to have your column. So you're going to need to track where you are in the file. So you're going to need to know what line you're at, what column you're at, and then you're going to have cursor right here. And cursor is effectively the index of where you are in the file. So basically here, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go here. Now picture this being a file, right? So this file has, it says it has 1800 characters. It's here at the bottom. You can't really see it, but this file has 1800 characters. And if you imagine whenever I pull this entire file down into memory, it's going to be put into a char array. And all the cursor is, is what index we are at at that char array so we can process things properly. So I'm going to go back here and from current slide. Okay, so next we have our length. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. This just makes sure that we don't run off the end of, we don't go off the deep end of our data and start processing data that's not there. So it's just the size of our data. Next, we have our token. So this is just going to be a list of all the tokens that we found in our tokenizer. After that, we have lines. So this is very important. This is mainly used for error reporting. So as we're processing our tokens, we also want to get every single line that's in our file. So that way, if we ever have an error, that's how we're able to print where the error happens. So if you ever notice, whenever I have an error, it says, here's your error, and then it has the actual line with an arrow below that line pointing to where the fault happened. After that, we have our state bars. This is basically anything that's not directly related to the tokenizer, meaning like this is, for instance, this is the dynamic strings variables. So that's what would be considered a state bar. It's just variables that are holding some type of state that is maybe not used by the tokenizer or just anything really. So that's what that represents. And let's go to the next one. So after that, we have our parser. Uh, so of course, we're going to need to have our tokenizer. So we're going to have a pointer reference to our tokenizer so we can actually get the information. 
And as per standard, we have our error management system, so we can fire off errors if we run into anything. And the parser is even simpler. So all we need is we need a cursor. So a cursor is going to be where we are as we're processing our actual syntax tree. So as we're building a tree here, I'm actually going to exit here. And we'll go into this a little bit later. But as we're processing our tree, we're going to have multiple trees that represent data. So this is going to be a tree. This is going to be a tree right here and so on and so forth. So every piece of data is going to be a tree. And we want to keep track of where we are in our abstract syntax tree. So if we add this to our tree map, then we're at index zero. If we add this alias keyword to our parser and our tree list, then we want to be at cursor one. That way, if we add anything inside of here, we know where we are. So for instance, let's say this would be tree index two, because this is zero, this is one, this is two. So if we try to add this field, instead of plopping this and doing something like this, where we're adding it after this, we know that our cursor is at index of two. So we're going to put it inside of here. That's pretty much how the parser knows where to put all of its data. After that, we have, let's go back to here. After that, we have our source file. This just is whatever source file we're processing. After that, we have our parser or whether or not we parsed the data successfully. So this is basically going to be used for as we're compiling our code. Once we process all of our files, we're going to check to see if that file parsed correctly. And if it did, then we'll compile it. Otherwise, we just ignore it. And this panic flag is what controls whether or not this is parsed. So basically what this is, is let's say you're a parser. There could be situations where you can get into an infinite loop of errors and your parser can generate thousands of errors. So we basically just want to have a limit so that we don't spend forever creating thousands of errors and the user doesn't know what's going on. After that, we have our access types. What this is, is this is your types like public, static, void. All this is, is just a list of the current access types that we're processing. And then finally, of course, we have our tree. This is just going to be a list of abstract syntax trees. And we're going to use our cursor to keep track of what index we are in this tree. All right, so now we're going to look at the back end. So here's how I structured my back end. We have our compiler, we have our error management system, our optimizer, and then our code generator. So if the compiler is successful, we then send the data. We send all of our state that we've converted to our optimizer, and then our optimizer then converts that state into something else and then sends it to our code generator, and then we go on from there. So again, we're just converting one state to another to another. And of course, if any one of these things break, we are not going to go to the next one. So if the compiler breaks, whoops, I actually made a mistake. If the compiler breaks, then we'll go to, we won't go to our optimizer. And if our optimizer breaks, then we won't go to our code generator. All right, so our compiler is pretty complicated. I actually couldn't fit everything in here. Um, so I'm just going to try my best to explain what's going on. So of course, we have our error management system. We have our list of parsers that I talked about earlier. So if you remember, we every parser has a parsed flag. So as we're compiling our code and we're compiling every single file, if any parser in this list is not parsed correctly and that parsed flag is set to false, then we just won't process it. Uh, after that, so we have a bunch of different maps here. So we have our enums. This is going to be a list of all of our enum classes that we created. After that, we have our string map. So this is any string literals that we have. It's just a list of strings, pretty simple. Uh, after that, we have our import map. So what this is going to be is this is going to have a map to the parser or the file that we're processing and the imports that that file has. So if you remember, if I go here and I go over here, if I type imports, imports std, uh, every file is going to have an import map, and it's just going to be a list of all of these. So if I go back, after that, we have our modules. Um, that's going to be the total modules that we have in our application. 
So if we try to import a module that doesn't exist in this modules array, then we'll of course get an error because you can't import a module that doesn't exist. After that, we have our inline map. That's going to be just a list of fields that was converted to an inline value. So what that is, is let's say we have, I don't know, uh, let's create a variable here. Let's say my num, and we want to assign that to 99. The compiler can actually figure out that whether or not to inline this value. So like if it's a constant, if this is like a constant value and it's also a static value, then if it's never going to change and it's static, we can pretty much assume that it's safe to say we can inline this value. That way we can speed up the execution of our code. After that, we have generics. So this is just going to be a list of all of our generic classes. This is going to be a list of all of our total classes that we have in our language. This is going to be our scope map. So scope map is a little bit complicated. What this is, is this is basically going to represent the scope that we're in. So as we're processing things, right, you're basically going from one scope to another. So when you're first processing everything, you're at global scope, which means you're at the highest level possible. And then let's say you start processing a class. Now you're at the class scope. And then let's say now we're inside of a function. Well, now you're in a instance scope if the function is an instance function and you're in a static block or a static scope if the function is static and so on and so forth. UPC map, uh, this is unprocessed classes map. Oh man, I'm not gonna even get into what that is. Uh, this is basically a map of all of the classes that we haven't processed because of generics. Um, I don't want to get into this right now, but just know that that's what that is. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, after that, we have our note map. What this is, is this is just a array of strings for whenever we tell the user, hey, note this value was defined here. If you've ever seen that in like C++ or a different language, whenever you get an error, we just want to make sure that we don't constantly tell the user, hey, note this was defined here. Because whenever we tell the user like, hey, notice that this was defined here or something else, that's separate from an error because all it is is just like a warning or more of like a informational thing. So we just wanna make sure we don't bombard the user. After that, we have our source files, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Then we have our out file. That's gonna be what the file is that we're gonna to output to, uh, or it's gonna just be a string of whatever the name of the file is. After that, we have our current. So what this is, is this is just gonna be a pointer to the current parser that we're executing inside of our parsers list. And that's pretty much it. After that, we have our main method. So this is going to be a pointer to our main method. So of course, we're going to need to have a main method in our programming language because we need to start our program. So that's what that is. And yeah, that's it. Oh, and of course, there's state. So because I couldn't fit everything else in here, uh, this represents just any other state variables that we would like to track. Um, there's dozens of state variables. And because I want to not get too much in depth into how my compiler is built because of course we're going to get into that later and i want it to be not so much about the code and more abstract just note that whenever you have a compiler you're probably going to have a ton of state variables so that's all that represents after that we have oh okay so i guess we do have our compiler state i forgot i added this um so our compiler state consists of a couple things so it consists of whether or not our compiler succeeded uh, or did our compiler fail? These are just two booleans. Um, the total amount of classes that we have, the total amount of methods that we have, uh, delegate GUID or graphical user ID or generic, I don't remember what GUID stands for. Uh, this is just for delegate functions. Um, if you guys remember, delegate functions are a way to delegate work to another object. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, of course, you wanna also keep track of how many thread locals you have. My language supports thread locals, so that's what that is. Uh, whether or not we have a main method. You don't probably need this Boolean. This is kind of redundant. You could probably just check to see if main method is null, right? This is just a pointer to a function. So all you have to do is just check to see if that's null. So you probably don't need that. I don't know why I have that. Uh, after that, we have our main method signature. This is important. Um, so here, I'm going to show you guys this really quick. 
So I'm not going to go into detail about how this works, but here's my standard library, and in my standard library, I have oops, I have a runtime. So whenever you want to run a program, right? You guys remember we can say def main, and you can do a couple different things. You can say you want a main function that just has no parameters. You can say you want a main function that returns a var. You can also say you want a main function that has data or args, um, which is just a string, S-T-R-I-N-G. It's a string array, right? So you can like get parameters passed to it. So how exactly do I do that? Like, how does this work? Um, so basically what I do is I have this runtime file and this is actually what gets called or this is what runs before your program actually starts. So effectively, in my programming language, this is considered the main method. This runs, and these are considered the user main method. So if you remember, I have a pointer to our main method. So if we go here, I have a pointer to our main method, and what that's going to do is that's going to be a pointer not to this function, but it's going to be a pointer to the user's main method. So the user still has to create one, and then what happens is my compiler basically checks to see do we have the signature of this or this or this. I'm going to add a few extra signatures here because this isn't enough, but you get the gist of it. Um, if the user has any one of these, I would basically set one of these signatures to the pointer of the actual method. And then down here, you can see I'm actually checking to see if this one is not null, if it's not equal to zero, or is this one not equal to zero? Otherwise, you know, uh, run main three. So that's what that pretty much is. Um, and this is kind of how my programming language runs. This is somewhat similar to how C++ runs. When you actually have your main method, your main method isn't the first thing that gets called. It has to set up stuff. Like you can see, I'm setting up my runtime environment. I'm initializing my TLS system or my thread local state system or whatever whatever it's called. Um, and you can see these are empty functions, but the compiler injects a ton of code into both of these. So yeah, that's how that's how that works. But if we go back, current slide. Okay, so let's continue on. Uh, of course, we have our GID. This is just how I create unique IDs for anything like fields, classes, whatever. Um, we also have a panic button or a panic flag for our compiler because, hey, you know, maybe our compiler freaks out and it's generating thousands of errors. We don't want that to happen, so we just want to make sure we cover that. After that, we have our current module, and what that is is that's just whatever module we're in. So, like, every time you're processing a file, if you remember, you have the module at the very top that you declare, and that's what that is. Uh, and then finally, we have our stage. So, our compiler has multiple stages. Our compiler has a pre-processing, a post-processing, and a compilation stage. And we just want to know what stage we're at in the compiler. And depending on that stage will depend on what we do, basically. And I would say out of everything here, you guys probably are going to want to have a stage if you're going to build a pretty complicated language because there are certain things that you can and can't do at certain stages of the compiler. So you just want to make sure that you have that and you know where you're at so you can handle that situation accordingly. And finally, we have our error manager. Uh, I made this very bland and very generic because, again, this is high level. This is very abstract. So whenever you create an error manager, all you're going to need is you're going to need to have a state variable or a bunch of state variables that represent whether or not you're processing an error currently, whether or not you're reporting every single error that you come across, or any other type of state variables. Uh, after that, you're going to need to, of course, have a list of all of your errors. So these are the errors that the user sees. These are the total errors that the compiler has found. And then these are any warnings that the compiler has found. So you want to have these two separated out because your compiler might generate like 100 errors. But because of my system and how smart I've made my error manager, the user might only see out of those 100 errors, maybe 20, because majority of the errors are not useful to what the user needs to see, and they're probably just repeats or some other weird situation. So after that, uh, okay, so the back end, to be continued, 
I am nowhere near, as you guys know, I'm rewriting the compiler and I'm not that far along, so I can't really explain how I'm going to do this because I haven't gotten to it yet. So that's why I don't have anything here for that. But eventually, later on in the YouTube series, I will revisit this PowerPoint and we can kind of talk about how I'm going to set up my optimizer and my code generator. Okay, so my voice is starting to hurt because I've been talking a while. Uh, so here's a bird's eye view. Here's how everything works. So, and again, this is like, if you're going to build a compiler, you need to have this structure. Like, otherwise you don't have a compiler. Uh, so you're going to start out with your tokenizer then your parser, then your compiler, and as you saw, you have your optimizer and then your code generator. So, whoops. So literally, it's doing this flow. And if at any point, any one of these break, it doesn't go to the next one. And also, if you notice, everything here is split up. So this goes back to compartmentalizing everything that I told you about earlier. So you guys want to make sure that each section doesn't depend on the section previous right so the tokenizer doesn't depend on anything because it's not near it but the parser does not depend on the tokenizer meaning that the parser doesn't require the tokenizer to do any additional work for the parser to work it just says tokenizer give me the data let me do stuff with that data and then let me pass it on to the next component in our compiler so after that you have your compiler and yeah so it, this is pretty straightforward um, yeah, so still think you can't do it. Um, I taught myself everything you guys, or everything that I'm showing you guys here today. Um, I learned all of this. I didn't read any books. I didn't take any courses. And to be frank, there's not really any YouTube courses on how to build a compiler anyway. That's why I'm doing this series. So yeah, um, if you guys want to build a language, don't let somebody tell you that there's already enough languages out there. You don't need another. I mean, people come out with new languages all the time. So definitely reach for the stars and build a language. Um, credits, finally, uh, credits. I wanted to put that in here. Um, I did not make this PowerPoint. I got it from Sides Carnival. You can see the link here. Uh, and the photographs I got from upsplash.com. So um, definitely check these people out. Um, they're, they have some pretty nice uh, slides. Uh, so you can make some really nice PowerPoints. They have like tons of nice icons and just different things like that. So it's really cool. Uh, thanks. So any questions, um, write them in the comments below. Also, if you guys would love to help out the project, here's the link to my GitHub repo. Um, you, if you guys could fork it and like it, that would definitely help out the channel a ton because that gets the language a lot more visibility and gets more people to know that the language exists. So thanks for sticking with me throughout this YouTube series. Next episode, we're going to get into how to actually build the parser. I'm going to start it over again because a lot of things have changed and my parser videos that I created a while ago don't really apply anymore. So we're going to start over. But Yep, that's pretty much it. So thanks, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, definitely like, comment, and subscribe if you guys like what you saw and you want to see more. Till next time. See you guys later.